Thank you, Pastor John, and uh, good evening to everyone. What a privilege it is uh, to participate in this conference upon this rock, the biblical perspective of Roman Catholicism. It's uh, a great, as I said, privilege for me to be here, especially with uh, these speakers. This is the first time I've met Mike uh, Gendron, although uh, we've been in contact uh, previously. I get together with uh, Jacob in various places around the world. And uh, so here we are gathered uh, this weekend in Phoenix and uh, a very important topic. As I looked at the schedule, there will be three sessions that I will be presenting this evening session, titled Wiles of the Devil, Last Day's Deception in the World and in the Church, then tomorrow, uh, two sessions. Uh, the first one will be Another Jesus, the Eucharistic Christ and the New Evangelization. And uh, finally, third presentation titled uh, The Emerging Church. This evening I want to kind of present an overall presentation dealing with what I see taking place in the world today as Satan's plan to deceive not only the world, but also the church. And the Bible tells us that we are to beware of deception. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 12, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. You see, I've chosen the title for this presentation based on this portion of Scripture. The Bible tells us that God has an adversary, Satan, the devil, the dragon, the serpent. He's the one who deceives the whole world. He has a plan to deceive the whole world. And as Paul writes, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Some versions say the schemes, the plans that Satan has to deceive mankind. You see, it's a foundational principle of the Christian faith that this book, the Bible, God's Word, is the truth. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Jesus said it, John 17, verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. So God's word, according to God's word, is true. And as we've already said, if God has an adversary, wouldn't it be reasonable to suggest that God's adversary would do everything he could to undermine what God has said? I believe that that's the case. And we are to be awake, to be alert to Satan's devices. In Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 8, For you were sometimes darkness... But now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light, wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectfully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. You see these words were written to the church at Ephesus. But they're also for you, for me, today. And particularly today, in the times in which we're living, 
when Satan's agenda to deceive, well, the plan is intensified, I believe it's as great as it's ever been. And we live at a very period of history when the return of the Lord Jesus Christ could take place at any moment. And one of Satan's plan is to anesthetize the church, put them to sleep, so they don't see the schemes, the wiles of the devil, and they even participate. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. I like that phrase, a roaring lion. And I think it helps to illustrate exactly what Satan's plan is all about. This past January, I had the opportunity on a speaking tour while in South Africa to take a day tour of one of the animal farms near Johannesburg. And my host drove me around, and as we rolled down the window, I took snapshots of pictures, and he said, be very careful, just roll down the window. Because two weeks before I was there, some Japanese tourists had jumped out of their car to take a picture, and one of them was destroyed by the lion. You see, that's what lions do. And Satan is just like that. And we need to be aware of his plan for this age. Satan's agenda is to blind the minds of unbelievers, but it is also to blind the minds of believers who no longer believe in what God has said in his word. Can that happen? Yes, it can happen. And it is happening. Because in the last days, Satan wants to deceive the entire world in the name of the Savior. He wants to take as many humans with him hostage to hell. Now tonight I have a major task. I'm going to attempt to lay out an outline for some of the major ways in which Satan deceives the world in the church. And obviously, this is not possible to do properly in just a few short minutes of presentation. So what I'm going to do is to deal with some of the major ways in which he does this. And these are the ways in which I'm probably most familiar because I'm constantly dealing with these things in our ministry called Understand the Times. Let me just share with you just a very short version of my personal testimony. I was 30 years old before I became a Christian. I was a zealous promoter of Darwinian evolution. And my conversion was from evolution to creation, to Christ. And the first aspect of our ministry, the majority of what we did was to point people to the reality that there is a creator and you can trust and believe what God has said about origins. It was in the mid-80s that I started to see the connection between evolution and the New Age movement. Well, that was even before the term New Age was coined. But a revival of Eastern religion, a reintroduction of Eastern religion, revival of ancient Babylonianism into the present, and how that fit into Bible prophecy. And so those were the two major areas in which I was involved in making presentations. It was in 1988, I moved to Southern California where I was on staff at a large church for several years. And while there, the doors opened for me to travel internationally. And as I traveled around the world to speak in various places, pointing people to the Creator and warning them about the consequences of rejecting the Creator, I noticed in various churches and denominations something was happening. And that is, Christians were embracing teachings that weren't in the Scriptures extra biblical experience, and I came to the realization that one of the greatest threats to Christianity was Christianity that wasn't biblically based. Those three areas have been primarily what we have been involved in in our ministry, Understand the Times. And so I'm going to share some of these things with you this evening. I believe that these three areas have been duping the world and will continue to. Number one, there's no God. 
And if there's no God, there's no gospel. Number two, everything is God, therefore there's no gospel. And number three, well, there's the gospel, but there's more than what the Bible has to say. So let's begin. First of all, let's lay the foundation. What do we mean? What is the gospel? Well, very simply, there's a verse. It means a lot to me. It was the verse which God revealed to me when I was 30 years old, when I came to the truth. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The creator of this universe, who created everything, created mankind, created an Adam and an Eve who had a harmonious relationship with the Creator. That's how it began. But that relationship between man and God was severed because of sin. And from that point on, all men, women born into this world, separated from God because of sin, would have forever been that way. But the Creator had a plan. He came to this earth Himself. He lived a perfect life in our place. We couldn't do it, but He did. And his life was sacrificed, his blood was shed upon the cross, and he died. And three days later he resurrected, and today he lives. And whosoever would believe in him and who he is and what he has done, and acknowledge who we are and what we've done, and ask for forgiveness. The Bible says we can enter into a relationship with the Creator that will last for eternity. That's the simple gospel. And it's that gospel message that Satan hates. He doesn't want people to believe in it. So what does he do? Well, number one, if there's no God who created, there's no gospel. And the greatest way that Satan has convinced man that there's no God is by convincing people that what the Bible says about God and origins in the Genesis record is a myth. If he can convince people to believe that there's no creator, that we're here as a result of some kind of a process of chance called evolution, then the gospel is nullified. There are billions of people who believe that. They say evolution is true, Because they say, in the beginning, there was matter, and it blew up, and as a result of an explosion, we have everything which exists in the cosmos. But no one has ever observed an explosion that has produced order. They say that evolution is true because they say the particles were floating around in the cosmos came together as a result of gravity to form our planet Earth that has all of the right conditions to support life. No one has ever observed anything like this ever happening. But they believe that it happened. They say that evolution is true because in the distant, unobservable past, non-life became life spontaneously. And again, it's never been observed. All life we've ever observed has come from life which pre-exists. They say that evolution is true because they say over billions of years of time, simple has become complex There's been a progression of life from lower to higher. But when we look at the fossil record, there are no intermediates. There are no intermediates that are living today. We see that life has the ability to vary horizontally within genetic boundaries. The evolutionary view is a myth. They say that evolution is true because over billions of years, they say that the layers of the earth were laid down gradually by the same kinds of processes that are occurring in the world today. And life lived and died, and it's buried in these layers. But the only place you can find this sequence is in a textbook drawing, not in the Earth's crust. The layers can be formed quickly and catastrophically and agrees with what the Bible tells us in the Genesis record. They say that evolution is true because they say our ancestors are brood ape-like creatures and we've evolved. And there's a complete lineage from apes to humans. But the only evidence they have to present are paintings and murals and models based on incomplete fossils. Yet billions of people believe it. 
They believe that this is true and therefore they've rejected the basic premise of the gospel that there's a God who created. The impact of evolutionary theory has been paramount. Evolutionism has been used as the basis for atheistic communism. Hundreds of millions of people gone to their grave believing that God does not exist because they believed in evolution. Evolutionism has been used as the basis of the religion of humanism, which of course we're very familiar with here in the Western world. And as a result, billions of people do not believe in God. They believe that everything exists because of evolution. Point number two. Satan's second major goal and agenda, and that is to convince people to believe that everything is God. And if everything is God, there's no gospel. You see, you can read about this in Romans chapter 1. It makes it very clear. Paul tells us this in verses 18 to 32. When man denies the God who made everything, he will eventually worship everything that God has made. The evidence that God has created is so obvious from the things that he has made. When we willingly choose to ignore that evidence, our foolish hearts will be darkened. Professing to be wise, we become fools and we believe a lie. And then Paul says you can expect various things to occur. Man will go on a downward pathway to immorality and depravity. And he will head on an upward pathway towards a spiritual reality and he'll begin to worship anything and everything as God, including himself. You see, he believes that evolution is God. The impact of evolutionary indoctrination, again, well, it's had a major influence on the world. The belief that man has arisen from slime And then he's on his way upward towards the divine. The belief that there's various methods and therapies and techniques, tools that one can use to elevate man onward and upward towards Godhood. And these basic beliefs and ideas and tools and mechanisms and therapies, well, they're not new. They come out of the East. Eastern religion, which teaches... Man can be God, that everything is God. And these ideas are introduced even in our public schools in the name of science. They're nothing more than witchcraft and paganism, a belief that man has the ability to evolve onward and upward to higher levels of consciousness. It's the exact same lie that originated in Eden. And by the way, One of the terms for kundalini yoga is called the serpent power. That shouldn't be difficult to understand from the scriptures. As a result of the impact of evolutionary indoctrination, billions have been deceived that everything is God or that man can be God. Billions have been deceived that there are many ways to God. Therefore, the gospel of Jesus Christ is rejected. Two major schemes, the wiles of the devil. Number three, and now we get down to more of the theme of this conference. This is one of Satan's major plans. He wants people to believe that they believe in the gospel in the biblical Jesus. But he has a way of duping people because he convinces people that the gospel is based on more than just what the Bible mentions. It's necessary to add to or remove from the words of inspired scripture. And the emphasis that Extra-biblical experience or revelation is a required prerequisite to know the truth. The Bible warns us about last day's deception 
As Jesus said, when he was asked, what will it be like? Matthew 24, he listed various signs of the times of the last days. And the majority of these signs have to do with end times deception. He said, many will be deceived by many in his name. He said there would be false teachers. He said there would be false prophets. He said there would be false appearances of Jesus. There would be false signs and wonders. Paul said there would be a falling away from the faith. And Paul's in Timothy, Timothy chapter 3 said the deception would grow worse and worse. See, the Bible's an amazing book. When the Bible makes statements regarding the future, we can trust and believe it with 100% accuracy. No other book has ever been written. In which statements made about the future can be believed and trusted. With Bible prophecy, we know three things. Either it's already been fulfilled, it's in the process of being fulfilled, or it will be fulfilled. So when Jesus told us beforehand, that's what he says in Matthew 24, behold, I've told you beforehand, this is what it's going to be like, we can know that this is what it's going to be like. Deception in his name. Falling away from the faith. The faith is based on the word. So people who once believed in God's word, well, they embrace another faith that isn't biblically based. I'll give you a few examples. Trends that have swept the world, sometimes for centuries, but more particularly in the past several decades. Do you know that there are millions of people who believe that they can receive truth and information from visitations, apparitions, of a woman claiming to be the mother of Jesus? And that, well, these are messages, they say, from heaven. She supposedly appeared here and there. And some of the messages sound quite biblical, but some don't. Do you know that some of these messages claim that there will never be peace in the world until Mary, the mother of Jesus, has given her rightful title as co-redemptrix? Not found in the scriptures. The Bible says there's one redeemer and his name is Jesus. There are millions of people who lobbied the past pope to proclaim a dogma before he died. Didn't quite do it. But he did dedicate the third millennium to Mary and he prayed to Mary and asked her to be the head of the church. Not in the scriptures. It was in October of 2000 that he brought the image of Our Lady of Fatima from Portugal to Rome. And there in front of 1,500 cardinals and bishops, yes, he dedicated the third millennium to Mary. His totus tuus was all to Mary. You would think as the head of the church, it would have been all to Jesus. His emphasis, as we're going to see tomorrow, was on evangelization. To win the world to the Roman Catholic Jesus that requires a priest to take a wafer, transubstantiate, conjure up Jesus, place him in a container, and then be worshipped, adored. Not in the scriptures. Or there are many who are now claiming that, well, Jesus is appearing here and there in various places. Do you remember what Jesus said? One of the signs of the last times? He said, when they say that I'm showing up here or there, in the desert, in the inner rooms, that's not me. Do you know the Bible teaches there's another Jesus? Paul said, it's whom we have not preached. You don't find that Jesus in the scriptures. There's a difference. If you were Satan, 
wouldn't you take the scriptures, the biblical Jesus, and add a twist? You see, we need to be very careful. Because I believe there are billions of people who are sincere, but they're sincerely deceived. And the Bible tells us that on Judgment Day, well, let's read the words of Jesus, Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Upon the word of God. Upon following Jesus and his word. And these people believed. They sincerely believed but they had been deceived in the name of Jesus. They'd experienced the miraculous and they spent eternity in hell. That's the consequence. And every time I read this portion of Scripture, I'm deeply troubled because I know that when I confront people who believe they believe because they've embraced extra biblical teachings and when we point them to the biblical truth and they get angry and upset, Understand why. They really do believe they believe. But we have to believe in the truth. Because the consequence of being deceived is eternity in hell. Now point number four. And this is the most difficult one. I said we were going to talk about Wiles of the devil, deception in the world, and in the church. And we've talked about the world, Satan's plan. There is no God because of evolution, number one. There is no God because everything is God because of evolution, number two. And number three, people that believe they believe in the gospel, but they believed in another gospel and spend eternity in hell. I would suggest to you that those three categories would account for the vast majority of the world's population. Billions of people. Now we want to talk about deception in the church where people believe. They believe what God has said. They have preached what God has said. They've lived by what God has said. But somewhere along the line, the path of their life, they've kind of embraced some things that led them away. And you see, this is one of Satan's major plans. He will do everything he can to target those who have trusted and believed in Jesus. I don't believe that he can... Take away their salvation. Maybe you disagree. That's what I believe. But I believe that Satan can make believers ineffective by getting them to believe other things that aren't in the Bible. He wants to make them ineffective. By destroying their witness. Getting them sidetracked. So he can render them useless. And I believe that this agenda intensifies in the last days before Jesus returns. The Bible talks about a great falling away. Do you know that one of the greatest prophetic signs that I think is the least preached on is this. The closer that we get to the return of Jesus, 
Fewer and fewer people who profess to be Christians will be prepared for his return. Is that scriptural? Well, you find it in the Bible. There's these warnings, be alert, be awake. Do you remember the parable of the sleeping virgins? I think that Satan has a plan not only to dupe the world, but to dupe the church, particularly in the last days. And based on other scriptures, 2 Thessalonians 2, I already made reference to it, Paul writes, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. It would look to me that one of the prerequisites in the Bible for the appearance of the Antichrist would be a period of time when people fell away from the faith. That's hard to believe. But if you read through this portion of Scripture, you'll see why. Strong delusion. God allows it. They believe a lie, not the truth. And in 1 Timothy 4, we can see why. Paul writes, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Satan has some help. You see, there's two camps of Christians. They say the kingdom will be established here on earth through man. And that really the planet's going to get better and better. But I believe the Bible teaches the opposite. Jesus indicated to us what it would be like. He said it would be as it was in the days of Noah. Not a great revival. There was only eight people who trusted and believed. And many other scriptures point out to the fact that there's going to be a lot of problems. People falling away from the faith. Great deception. Doctrines of demons. So we need to be alert. We need to be awake. Not asleep. Now I must preface the rest of what I'm going to say this evening with some words of caution. I pleaded with the Lord on several occasions, not to have to share this message. I'm compelled to. Because I love his word. It's the truth. And I have a passion for his word. I have a passion to tell people the truth. But I also have a compassion for people that are deceived. We all can be deceived. When I share the things that I'm going to share with you over the next few minutes, nearly always someone in the group will be offended. That's not my goal. But again, I have to say this. Truth is truth. And if there are things that I say that are not biblical, then please challenge me. I need to be corrected. The Bible teaches that we are to contend for the faith. It's very important. The faith is based on God's Word. God's Word is the truth. So when we see something happening that's undermining the truth of God's Word, we need to stand up for the truth. Contend for the faith. But there's a way to contend for the faith. Contending requires pointing those who are deceived back to the truth in love. Contending is not being contentious. Contending is telling people the truth in love. And I'm very much aware of the words of Jesus to the church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation. They could pick out false teachers. And Jesus said, you need to repent. 
you know, I commend you. You're able to accurately divide the word of God, but you've lost your love. And if you don't repent, I'm going to take away your lampstand, your testimony. So the point is this. We can be so right or wrong if we don't have love. And my prayer is tonight, as I share these things, it will come across to you, not one who's here to pick a fight, but to present what God has said in his word, to be a watchman, to contend for the faith, to point people to the truth and love. But nevertheless, I know there's always opposition. These words of Paul, I think, are very interesting. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9. Paul wrote, For a wide door for effective service has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Do you know that when we take a position or a stand for biblical truth, we're going to be confronted by all kinds of opposition from the world and from the church. I know that personally. Not in any way like Paul understood it. But you see, we have a public daily radio broadcast. I'm not sure if you hear it here. It's called Understand the Times. It's a commentary, five minutes. And I deal with a lot of topics from Genesis to Revelation, everything in between. But a lot of current events related to what's happening in the world today and how it relates to what the Scriptures say. And there's certain programs when I do them, well, I know what the results are going to be before I do them. Because I get emails, phone calls, letters, threats. And what I'm going to share with you now briefly, are five major trends that I see taking place within Christianity that are taking place that I see people straying away from God's Word. Believers. Observation one. Pastors, churches, and denominations that once promoted the biblical God as the Creator now are willing to admit that the Bible is not reliable when it comes to the subject of origins. They now accept that the speculation of man is superior to the revelation of Scripture. What do I mean by this? Well, I've been involved in ministry for over 25 years, and a lot of that has dealt with the subject of origins, pointing people to the fact that the Bible, emphasis on the subject of origins, can be understood in light of the facts of the world. In other words, the facts from astronomy, biology, geology, archaeology support what God has said. We can't prove creation. We weren't there. But when we read what God has said in his word, well, it makes sense. And many of the churches that I have spoken at over the 25 years previously who supported that premise that the biblical record on Genesis is true, well, something's changed. And they're saying, you know what? We need to reconsider evolution. We believe God created, but he used evolution to create. Or, well, God created, but he did it over hundreds of millions of years, and a day isn't a day, and the flood isn't a flood. Well, it was a local flood. And there were creatures that preceded Adam that were brute ape-like creatures. Let me read to you an article. Actually, it's a letter taken from St. Paul Pioneer Press, December 17, 2004. Pastors protest district policy. Letter says evolution Bible can coexist. Nearly 200 Wisconsin clergy want school officials in Grantsburg, Wisconsin to ensure evolution remains at the center of scientific teaching in the schools. We, the undersigned Christian clergy from many different traditions, believe that the timeless truths of the Bible and discoveries of modern science may comfortably coexist. We believe that the theory of evolution is a foundational scientific truth. 
one that has stood up to the rigorous scrutiny and upon which much human knowledge and achievement rest. To reject this truth or to treat it as one theory among others is to deliberately embrace scientific ignorance and transmit such ignorance to our children. We urge school board members to preserve the integrity of the science curriculum by affirming the teaching of the theory of evolution as core component of human knowledge. We ask that science remain science, that religion remain religion, two very different but complementary forms of truth. It's not uncommon. One pastor told me when I had been invited to come to his church to speak on creation, he said, whatever you do, be careful what you say. I said, I don't understand. He said, well, we're seeker friendly. And he said, we have a lot of people who will be evolutionists. We don't want to offend anyone. Observation two. Pastors, churches, and denominations once opposed to the influences of the New Age are now embracing New Age and Eastern religious practices as harmless and even beneficial. Well, when I do programs about yoga, Christian yoga, the phone rings off the wall. What's wrong with it, they say? You see, you have to understand this is rooted in Eastern religion. It's an oxymoron to say you can practice yoga as a Christian. Or what about the gospel according to Harry Potter? Oh, it's just fun and fantasy. You can't take this away from our children. But the Bible tells me witchcraft is witchcraft and wizardry is wizardry. And it's an abomination. Whether it's presented in a repackaged form. It's amazing. Where some people get the gospel these days. Observation three. Pastors, churches, denominations that once boldly proclaimed the gospel now feel the gospel is too offensive to unbelievers and therefore needs to be disguised in order to make it more seeker-friendly. I'm sure that you're familiar with these churches. The gospel without the shedding of blood, it's too offensive. Yes, we're to be seeker-friendly, but we can never compromise the truth. And human effort to establish God's kingdom here on earth is not in the Bible. You see, today we live at this period of time where people are driven, pastors are driven for church growth. And there are methods that you can implement for church growth at the expense of the truth. And churches can grow, but as they do, well, they're very shallow. Observation four. Pastors, churches, and denominations that once exposed false teachers are now less discerning False doctrines embraced by the Roman Catholic Church seem no longer important. Many willingly embrace ecumenism and seek unity at any cost, but not at the foot of the cross. Well, there's so many examples I could use. It's been happening for some time. I don't believe that I would have ever gone down the road to research Roman Catholicism if I hadn't had a two-day layover in Rome in 1998. I'd seen Roman Catholicism in other places, but not in Rome. And it was at that time, while evangelicals and Roman Catholics were signing documents to agree to agree and evangelize together. But there's too many differences, too many problems with biblical Christianity and the Roman Catholic teachings. 
But it's been happening. Here's a picture of the head of the largest Christian television network in the world. It was in Rome, shook hands with the Pope. And here in Trinity Broadcasting Network headquarters in Costa Mesa, California on the second floor is the Queen of Heaven and baby Jesus. I wonder who's influencing who. And here is a picture of Nikki Gumbel, who's the head of the Alpha program last year in Rome, shaking hands with the Pope, now deceased, agreeing to evangelize together. And documentation can easily be made that, yes, there's joint meetings, Roman Catholics, evangelicals together, but it can also be documented that evangelicals are learning about the saints, the sacraments, and Mary. Observation five, and then we'll be finished. Churches once focused on Jesus and his word are now focused on men, their methods, and their movements. And as a result, well, they really believe that their eyes are focused on Jesus and that's the way it's supposed to be. The Bible teaches us, keep your eyes on Jesus, His Word. But what happens? Very subtly, people who have been sound Bible teachers, leaders, for the sake of church growth will get their eyes off Jesus and his word and they'll get their eyes on some man or woman and their methods because they have a movement and they want success and as a result they've got their eyes off Jesus and they don't even know it. And that creates a great problem. People that are sincere, but they've been duped. And it's the basis of falling away. When we begin to follow after some man and his teachings that aren't scriptural. See, Satan's clever. Now take a moment. Think of a method. Think of a name. Positive thinking. Seeker friendly. You don't have to answer out loud. Purpose driven. And we could list many more. What happened to the Bible? Where is this headed? Well, tomorrow in my last section, I'm going to share with you what's happening. Where the church is headed. It's called the emerging church. Some say it's the church on the other side. Well, Rick Warren, in his introduction or forward to the emerging church book, has said, as a pastor, I've watched churches adopt many contemporary styles in worship, programming, architecture, music, and elements. That's okay as long as biblical message is unchanged. But whatever is in style now will inevitably be out of style soon, and the cycles of change are getting shorter and shorter. Aided by technology and media, new styles and preferences like fashions are always changing. So when the church gets market-driven, we're looking for new methods in order to bring people into church. Rick said in his introduction or his, to the emerging church book, Vintage Christianity, the New Generation, in the past 20 years, spiritual seekers have changed a lot. In the first place, there are a whole lot more of them. There are seekers everywhere. I've never seen more people so hungry to discover, develop the spiritual dimension of their lives. That is why there's such an interest in Eastern thought, New Age practices, mysticism, and transcendent. He says, today seekers are hungry for symbols and metaphors and experiences and stories that reveal the greatness of God. 
Because seekers are constantly changing, we must be sensitive to them like Jesus was. We must be willing to meet them on their own turf and speak to them in ways that they understand. There's a danger in that. I'll show you that vintage Christianity is all about candles, incense, icons, liturgical, sacramental, and the saints. Vintage Christianity is sensual, experiential, extra-biblical, and it provides a bridge to the Roman Catholic Church. I believe that's where the church is headed. You may disagree, but the present pope, like the past pope, is Eucharistic, Marian, an ecumenical, and he wants to bring unity. What do the scriptures say? Very briefly, Jeremiah 17, 5 to 9, don't trust in man. You'll be like a bush in the desert. Trust in God. And then you'll be like a tree whose roots are planted by a stream of water. We must always trust in God and his word. And as I conclude, the solution is this. Jude said it. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. I believe we're living in that period of time as never before where Christians are being challenged to pay attention to what God has said and less attention to what men are saying. And trust and believe in this book and teach this book in spite of the desire for people to be entertained rather than taught. That's the challenge. Because Jesus is coming soon. And when he comes, let's be awake. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. It is the truth. Your Holy Spirit guides us into the truth. And Lord, I pray that you would take your truth, your word, and teach us. Help us to understand what you have said, and help us to apply it to our lives. And Lord, help us to be vessels that are willing that you can use to be able to reach out and to share this truth of your word to others in love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.